particular uh, good morning and welcome to our very distinguished witnesses this morning. Uh, we have apologies from Lord McGuinness, but otherwise we are complete as a committee. Um, this is our fifth oral evidence session of the Common Framework Scrutiny Committee. And I'm delighted that we've been able to uh, welcome this morning three very distinguished um, contributors. Professor Michael Keating, who is a professor of politics at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, Dr. Hugh Rawlings, who has done very many things, but who as an advisor to the Welsh Government over many years and a civil servant, but is honorary professor at Cardiff University at the moment. And Jess Sargent, who is the senior researcher at the Institute of Government. And it is Jess's second appearance at the committee. Uh, you came, Jess, for that first meeting when we were setting out um, our terms of reference and were extremely helpful then. And we look forward to hearing what you uh, re have reflected on. But very, very grateful to the three of you for helping us at this stage of our, of our committee. Um, as you know, this is a live, um, par a parliamentary live TV uh, appearance uh, of the committee, and we will be constructing a proper and full transcript, which you will be sent and which you will correct if there are any errors. Um, it's been quite a, um, a roller coaster for this committee. We were set up in September with a blank canvas because common frameworks were a very unknown quantity and they had been a very minority interest. And so to an extent we have learned as we have gone on, both in the inquiry we've been pursuing as to the theory and practice of the common frameworks, but also as we have reviewed and interrogated those frameworks which have come to us in summary or uh, eventually as a full transcript. And we have found uh, all manner of uh, interest, we say, um, in terms of the expression of divergence, the expression of harmony, management of divergence, much else besides much about process, but a lot about politics as well. Uh, we are still very much at the beginning of the frameworks because, as you know, there are over 30, and I think we've seen seven or eight in some form. So we have got quite a lot of work to do, but we have enough to make some judgments. And we will be making a short report um, by Easter uh, um, in which your evidence will feature. One of the things that happened, of course, in the early on in, this, in the autumn, when we were um, setting out our, our own processes, was the emergence of the Internal Market Bill, which occupied us for most of the autumn, um, in both in the actual process of going through the House and the way it impacted on and threatened to impact on the purpose and the principles, as well as the operation of the frameworks. And of course, therefore, one of the things that we do want to ask you, along with uh, what have you made of the processes so far, one of the things we want to ask you is about your own appreciation of that act as it is now and its impact on the frameworks and its impact in general on the devolved administrations. But as we uh, go through our questions, which I know you will have seen and, and elaborate on them, please feel free to tell us anything or uh, tell us things that we have questions we answer questions we haven't asked i say um so that's uh it, where we are at the moment um and so i will start if if i may by asking um our three witnesses first of all actually as close observers as unique observers of this process from these different standpoints what have you made of it so far big question but also, what do you think have been or are likely to be the constitutional impacts from your own professional perspective? I'm going to start with Jess and then um, go to uh, Hugh and Michael, because Jess, this is your second appearance and you will probably have been watching it from the perspective of someone who has been looking at it um, 
genuinely actually um, independently, but also someone who knows the House of Lords rather well. So can you give us your second impressions, please? Absolutely. Um, so I think overall, uh, the Common Frameworks process has uh, gone well in that uh, there is still good working on it um, with, from all governments, despite some of the political challenges that have been created by uh, the UK Internal Market Act, although uh, there is perhaps less good cooperation on that specific piece of work, uh, Common Frameworks um, and working on that is, is still ongoing. And I think that is really positive and we shouldn't underestimate that. Um, in terms of progress of agreeing uh, frameworks, as you say, that has been uh, somewhat delayed um, since uh, throughout throughout the years, first by Brexit, um, then by coronavirus, and there have been real constraints on the capacity of the devolved administrations, um, which I think has been a real limiting factor in being able to make progress on actually, you know, agreeing those those outline frameworks. But as you say, they are now starting to, to trickle in. And from certainly from my perspective as a researcher, it makes it a lot easier to uh, be able to consider the implications of them. Um, to actually kind of see what a framework would look like because for the past two years we've been talking about them in the abstract to to a certain extent um, so I think now the real work starts um, and kind of seeing the detail um, as you say there have been a few developments um, throughout the course um, of the Common Frameworks program, notably first the, um, the agreement of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, in which Northern Ireland has a lot of obligations um, to uh, continue to apply EU law in a huge number of areas where there's quite a significant intersection between those areas and Common Frameworks. And second, as you say, uh, the publication in the, the passing of the UK Internal Market Act. Um, again, those market access principles of future recognition and non-discrimination will apply um, in a a lot of those common framework areas. So I think up until now, it's been quite difficult uh, to come to kind of definitive um, answers about how common framework progress um, programs should be managed because um, there's been a lot of outstanding questions on both what the implications of the UK internal market will be and what the implications of the Northern Ireland Protocol will be. I think now this committee um, has already started work and is in a very good position to consider um, those kind of cross-cutting programmes of work. Um, and I think going forward, um, that's the real question that I think uh, I'll be particularly interested in, um, is how to manage these three different programmes of work which have significant implications for each other um, and how the UK government itself organises itself to be able to manage those different programs of work. We know that common frameworks will be primarily led out of individual policy departments, um, and sometimes there might be intersection with other departments, but uh, broadly speaking, those will broadly be managed in specific departments. DEFRA, as we know, has a, has a responsibility for a lot of them. Uh, the UK Internal Market Act um, and kind of discussions about new exclusions or how that framework might be tweaked are likely to take place in bays. Um, the Northern Ireland Protocol may be run out of the Cabinet Office. It may be, um, there may be a role for the Northern Ireland Office. We're still not clear on that. So there's a lot of different work going on in government. And to be honest, I don't think the government yet has come together to think about a kind of coherent strategy to managing those different programmes of work to make sure that they all work together. Um, and I think going forward, I think that is the really important challenge Obviously, the devolved administrations will also face that challenge, but actually being smaller um, uh, administrations, to some extent, they're better at, at joining up and, and considering this kind of joint working. Um, so, yes, I think going forward, the big challenge will be thinking about how all those work together and also how that should be scrutinised. And I think the committee um, could have a very important role to play in that. Thank you very much indeed, Jess. That's extremely helpful and, uh, and articulates some of the things that, that we have certainly been wrestling with ourselves, particularly in recent weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, Hugh, what is your perspective on this? Um, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I sort of see this um, in, uh, uh, well, sorry, I should begin by saying, of course, I agree with everything that Jess has said, but I look at this from um, a slightly broader perspective in that, um, for me, it, it's um, the Common Frameworks Programme is an illustration of a more fundamental proposition um, about how the UK should be governed. Um, I'm sure the committee is familiar with the um, the, the broadly two views of devolution. 
that uh, devolution on the one hand was um, established as a set of special governmental arrangements for the various devolved territories, but it, it, it had relatively little uh, implication, as was, uh, it was said, for the governance of the UK as a whole. Um, the second view, which is the one I think which has come much more uh, into prominence in recent times, is that um, the UK, as a result of devolution, needs to be uh, depend on a basis of shared governance between the four uh, administrations. And that uh, the, the Common Frameworks Programme, it seems to me, would be, uh, if it was successful, a very good illustration of that, because, of course, it does involve um, or should involve um, agreeing uh, rules for particular um, areas of public policy and um, maintaining oversight of those by the four governments uh, mm -hmm. operating on the basis of consensus. And this, it seems to me, actually is a very important um, uh, potential illustration of the shared governance aspect of a devolution, which uh, goes alongside what you might call the self-rule uh, aspect of, of devolution within the various territories. Um, we will pick up on aspects of what you say in some detail, I think, as we go through the questions. There's a, 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 a very clear um, position of, of, you know, a statement of position on that point. Michael, what are your views on, on these very general questions? You're muted, Michael. The Frameworks Programme seems to have gone quite well at a technical level and it's a good way of trying to get agreement where there are common problems and common approaches to the problems. We still don't know what's going to happen where there is conflict so we still don't know about the dispute resolution mechanisms but I agree with Hugh that this is reliant on and draws on a system of intergovernmental relations which itself is profoundly unsatisfactory. Yeah. The joint ministerial committee and everything has surrounded it. The frameworks themselves I find uh, are, are going in different directions because they seem to be done one at a time. They become extremely complex and very difficult to read. And I've, mm. I've read a few of them uh, with, with very different understandings of what it's all about, partly because some of them are areas where there's going to be consensus and others are more sensitive areas. I think it is very important they should continue to be voluntary and not imposed. If they're to be legislative, then that raises the question of consent and what that consent is really meaning. And we have a big problem in our whole system of intergovernmental yeah. relations, about what consent actually means now. And then something that's not really come up in the papers I've read so far is how this fits into the level playing field uh, mm. measures in the trade agreement, trade and, and, and cooperation uh, agreement with the EU about non-regression, about rebalancing and so on, because the UK is still involved in European regulations. It doesn't have to obey them, but if it doesn't obey them, it doesn't follow, keep up with European regulations. There is a cost. The Scottish government said it wants to keep pace with European regulations. We don't know how that's going to work out. So there are a lot of difficult questions there that could make the matters extremely complicated. But as I say, the fundamental problem is we're starting with the detail of frameworks when we should be starting at a general philosophy of intergovernmental relations, and then the details should follow from that. Yeah, uh, absolutely right. We absolutely agree with that. I'm going to ask uh, Lord Thomas now to come in because some of the issues you raise on dispute resolution, at least, uh, but also the wider issues of uh, policy that cuts across the, the uh, frameworks. John. Yeah, I wanted to ask you in particular, focusing on some of the more detailed matters. And the first question I wanted to ask you, and I'm going to ask both questions at the same time, is are there areas you're concerned about? Obviously, one area which is very important to everyone are the frameworks covered by DEFRA, but none have been published yet. Does that concern you? And are there other areas you're concerned about? And the second question I wanted to ask you was <clears throat> the interrelationship between the framework on public procurement and its relationship to the, to the paper that has been published, which forecasts uh, UK-wide or possibly UK-wide legislation on public procurement uh, and how that is going to work. And are we going to see another 
issue relating to the uh, like that we faced in the internal market bill. And um, maybe uh, I could go in reverse order and start with Michael. Uh, yes, indeed. The most difficult and possibly politically sensitive ones might be in the area of agriculture, agricultural support and rural policy. I'm thinking about agricultural support measures, whether support for agriculture would come under the competition, the new subsidies and competition policy or, or not, how that would work out, how existing differences in support regimes, and they have existed even under EU membership, would work out, uh, how they would be acceptable, how they would play into the internal market as well. That's really uh, untested. Issues about regulation, GM crops and so on, how this would relate to future trade deals with third countries, the, whether agricultural trade would be part of the trade deals, and therefore access would have to be given to products that then would benefit once they came to England from the internal market bill. That could be important. It could also be extremely politically uh, sensitive. On the public procurement, I, I, I don't know as much about that, but I know that that is something that could become very sensitive as, as well, uh, given the importance of public procurement for regional policies. There are a number of issues in Scotland that are concerned, uh, subsidies and public procurement uh, that, that could potentially become sensitive. And once again, that relates not just to a UK-wide public procurement regime, but also to the level playing field provisions in the new agreement with the EU. Jess, could, could I come next to you on those two, those very general and specific questions? Yeah, absolutely. I think I would be most concerned um, about the frameworks where um, these various programmes of work, the UK Internal Market Act, the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, intersect, and also areas where we know the UK government is likely to want to diverge. Um, so uh, Michael mentioned uh, GMO as one of the examples. This is an area where the uh, DEFRA has published uh, proposals or is consulting on proposals to potentially change the definition um, of what a genetically modified organism is. Um, it's also an area where Northern Ireland is bound to continue to comply with EU law under the protocol. Um, so if it, England or UK government for England were to change the definition, that could create a barrier within the UK internal market. It's also an area which might be, um, which is covered by the market access principles, um, particularly mutual recognition. Um, so as Michael said, there's a risk that if that was accepted um, for England, England uh, products uh, with that different definition of a genetically modified organism would be able to be sold across um, Scotland and Wales and that could create um, political friction. Um, so I think those are the sorts of areas, that's just one example, but I think we'll see more um, as time comes along where divergence is, is not just uh, theoretically possible but perhaps likely and there are very foreseeable issues that could arise um, and likely political disputes that, that will that will arise if the UK government uh, goes ahead and, and changes regulations in in those areas. Um, on the procurement uh, question it's not something that I have um, a huge amount of kind of expertise in. Um, I know that there they were considering um, including procurement within the UK Internal Market Act, um, but it was decided that, that that was not the best kind of course of action. Um, I think the fact that it is, uh, it is flagged as a common framework area suggests to some extent an acknowledgement that aspects of that at least are devolved, which perhaps contrasts with uh, the subsidy control provisions, which was always an area of disputed competence. And now we've seen uh, the UK government legislate for. Um, it could be a case of perhaps certain officials responsible for preparing um, cons consultation materials, not necessarily being as devolution sensitive um, as they want. If you want to be charitable, it could uh, just perhaps be overlooking. But I think it's certainly, if we, go on the basis of the approach that the UK government has taken in, in other areas, I think there is legitimate cause, cause for concern, um, and we'll have to see how that develops. And Hugh Rawlings? Hugh, yes. Um, it, it, it's very interesting that um, the DEFRA uh, frameworks have not emerged. It's interesting to me because um, the intergovernmental working relationship between DEFRA and the other administrations was generally thought over the last two or three years to be in advance of the others. Um, certainly when Mr. Gove was Secretary of State um, uh, for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, he was very um, 
uh, well aware of the need for collaborative working between the uh, four administrations. And as a result, uh, some cl close working and sort of well-established institutions were put in place. And one would have thought that the frameworks uh, from DEFRA would emerge uh, fairly well um, in advance of some others um, uh, from other parts of Whitehall. Uh, so it is surprising that they haven't emerged and there must be some reason why. Um, on the uh, procurement um, uh, issue, um, like Jess, I'm not particularly familiar with it, but I do pick up her point, um, which is, I think, absolutely right, that there are parts of Whitehall, and I think procurement may be one of them, which are rather less devolution aware than others. And um, I would also um, place Bayes in that um, uh, 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 league, as it were, um, because from the outset of the evolution, my recollection was that the predecessors to Bayes, um, people at DTI, actually um, really did have considerable difficulty with um, uh, devolution as a concept. And they were the people, of course, in their current manifestation who produced the Internal Market Bill. And it, I think. One of the things that I have learned from uh, working on this over the last 20 years is that it is extraordinarily difficult for the UK government as a whole to have a broad perspective on devolution. There are pockets of um, very good practice and good understanding, and as I said, DEFRA was certainly one of them, but there are other parts which certainly weren't, and I think that the uh, emergence of the new proposals on procurement, which might well cut across the work on the framework uh, on procurement, is uh, an illustration of that. Thank you all very much indeed for those very perceptive and detailed answers. Thank you, John. Malcolm, can we move to you for your uh, question? Lord Thank Bruce. You. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, <coughs> I'm wondering, what, as these things emerge, what, a, what a, a, a good common framework will look like. Um, we've seen emerging, for example, the transport one that looks as if it was half-baked, half-hearted, not really taken seriously. We've seen others where a real serious work is being done, um, but they all look like they might be different. So what would be common? How would you judge a good one? And also what would be the dynamics once it's agreed? Because you have a dispute resolution in the original process, but as time goes on, other issues may arise and how they will accommodate the dynamics. But just one other issue, which may not be relevant, I don't know. But do you see some issue about the lack of devolution within England that actually the fact that Wales or Northern Ireland or Scotland might agree something, which some of the regions of England might also want, but they don't have a way of expressing their view. Is that relevant to the process? I'm, I'm not sure where, who, who would be best to start. Perhaps you, actually. Well, thank you. Um, what would a good one look like? Well, I suppose one would... Um, I hope to see agreed rules for the regulation of a particular aspect of social and economic activity, uh, including, of course, crucially, I suppose, uh, the scope and permissible extent of um, different regulatory approaches in uh, the different territories. Um, I would hope that each would provide for shared machinery uh, for keeping the operation of these rules under review mm -hmm. and uh, amending them by agreement as necessary. And then uh, thirdly, uh, as you mentioned, Lord Bruce, the, um, the whole dispute um, uh, resolution area, where I think that this is the sort of thing that would play into the wider um, IGR review, because if that is going to be successful, it will have to have um, an agreed system for resolving disputes. And I would hope that the various frameworks 
will be uh, play into uh, that new um, framework uh, if and when it is agreed. And so that there is a sort of a, a coherent um, uh, way of dealing with disputes between the governments across all governments. Thank you. Uh, Michael, perhaps you would. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd go along with Hugh. I think the first thing about frameworks is that they should be simple. The ones that I've read seem to them are incredibly complicated and far too detailed. You can't anticipate in advance and everything that's going to come up and trying to do so is just, is just futile. There should be a clear procedure and that should be standardized across these uh, agreements. And then with dispute resolution, again, the agreements quite rightly try to avoid things getting into disputes into the political level, try and resolve things at the technical level, which is fine, but where things are a matter of political difference and political dispute, we need somewhere in our whole intergovernmental relations, a place where those can be resolved in a, in a safe place, having some kind of neutral uh, arbiter or facilitator, rather than just simply being fought out by the politicians. And again, and perhaps we'll talk about this later on, some place in our intergovernmental relations where the, uh, the homework, the, uh, the research work uh, can be done by somebody who is not dependent on either level of government to do it. Thank you. I think the keep it simple is actually quite useful guidance for the committee as well. Um, Jess. Yes, I mean, I would uh, echo everything uh, Hugh and Michael have said there. Um, I think what's also important is there is a kind of clear and consistent application of those common frameworks principles that were agreed um, at the beginning uh, of the process. I think it's important that they are applied to each individual framework. So um, we know kind of on what basis decisions will be made and discussions will be taking place. Um, I think the other thing I would add um, is some level of transparency as well, I think will be important um, when frameworks are agreed. Um, it might be that governments come to decisions to allow divergence in, in some areas and not others and I think there needs to, needs to be very clear um, kind of on what basis those decisions were made, if there were disputes, um, how, how were they attempted to be resolved, were they resolved, um, I think all, all that would be very helpful in being able to assess how well um, a particular framework is, is working. Um, and I think that also kind of um, sh will also uh, roll into the dispute resolution procedure that we hope to see um, uh, and on the conclusion of the IGR review. Um, I hope that there will be enhanced transparency procedures around that um, so that we know the outcome um, of any dispute that was raised um, and that can be judged um, from you know, uh, relevant legislatures um, and also kind of interested parties um, to understand kind of why any particular decision was reached. Just, just one supplementary, I suppose, in early days in terms of what's emerging, but I mean, can you t can you identify what looks good and what doesn't look good from what we've seen so far, or is it too early to say? Perhaps all of you comment on that. Um, I think I've only seen uh, kind of the the frameworks that have been that have been uh, finalised and published. Um, so the committee will probably have um, have been party to, to some agreements that I haven't seen. Um, I think we have seen in some of them good practice in terms of uh, some of them do outline those principles and uh, do explain how they intend to apply them in, in each circumstance. And I think that that has been very helpful. Um, but uh, yes, I think in other areas. Uh, I, I would agree with Michael that sometimes they're a little bit hard to uh, get your head around if you're not a particular, uh, you don't have a particular area of policy expertise. Um, so I think it will be useful to see more frameworks before making an, a judgment and being able to compare what 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 is better um, and, and what is perhaps worse. Um, so I think I would reserve judgment on that until until I've seen a few more. I don't know whether Hugh or Michael have anything to add to that or they think it's too early. Okay, thanks Thank very you. much. Thank um, I, I can assure uh, all of you that uh, the emphasis you're putting on consistency uh, of process um, and transparency <laughs> and the need for templates is absolute manner to our ears. And uh, we have some um, information coming back from the Cognitive Cabinet Office that they are listening to this actually, so we, we will know more. Can I move to David, Lord Hope and your question please. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'd like you, each of you to um, focus on the powers that we now have in the Internal Market Act um, to exempt the common frameworks from the market access principles. 
Uh, the background to my question is that for a long time as the bill was passing through uh, the House of Lords, the government was strongly resistant to having any mention in the legislation at all about common frameworks. And we had a, a series of questions put to us in the course of our uh, receipt of um, comments on the frameworks as to how these two systems could live side by side, the market access principles on the one hand and the common frameworks on the other. In the end, the government were prepared to, uh, to take powers which are now set out in the act. They weren't prepared to be persuaded to have a duty to um, uh, give effect to an agreed framework, but at least the powers are there. And I suppose the question in my mind is whether what we now have is going to make a difference. And could I perhaps focus the point uh, precisely this way, how can we uh, best take advantage of the powers that now exist in uh, moving the common frameworks process forward? Uh, Michael, perhaps I could start with you to have a slightly different order this time. Oh yes, there's something else. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I find the, uh, the, the amendment which, which you yourself proposed really very, very useful because it does link the Internal Market Act to the frameworks. And, and a lot of people have been criticizing these for being apparently two separate processes going in different directions. It brings the devolved administrations into some kind of dialogue uh, about this uh, and therefore opens up the room for debate. But uh, as it came out of the final act, the UK government, of course, is still master of the game. There is a consent, yet another consent provision that's looks a little bit different from all the other consent provisions in there. But again, consent is not necessarily required because after a period of time, the UK Secretary of State can proceed anyway. And although changes in this list of exemptions are subject to consent, the initial list wasn't. In fact, the initial list in the form of the bill itself uh, didn't receive legislative consent across the uh, devolve. So that, that's still problematic there. And nor does it meet my reservations generally about the Internal Market Act, which are much wider than this, uh, because I think there is a difference between the frameworks which operate within the assumptions of the original devolution settlement, that is that the devolved governments have full regulatory authority, except where there is an exception, whereas the Internal Market Bill, Internal Market Act, I should say, reverses the presumption uh, and said that non-discrimination and mutual recognition apply generally unless they are exempted. Uh, and those rest upon two different philosophies of what devolution is about. The original philosophy, everything is devolved unless it's reserved, versus the philosophy, you know, everything's reserved unless it's devolved, which was the philosophy of the uh, 1978 Act. And the Internal Market Bill does follow that, that latter philosophy. It, these are broad transversal provisions which will apply and which can be taken up by private individuals and companies in the courts as well uh, unless there's a specific exemption to that and i still find that very problematic is there a way in which um, the frameworks can uh, as i as i put it earlier take advantage of what we now have is there some sort of uh, mechanism we should be trying to find in the frameworks that would do that well, 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 yes, the, the, the bill now says that the, uh, the UK governments uh, can, uh, subject to consent, change these lists and that the frameworks might be the sort of thing it might take into account when doing that. That obviously gives an opening here to work on the frameworks and make sure that properly constructed frameworks, clear frameworks can be used to effectively roll back some of the overreach of the Internal Market Act. Thank you. Hugh, what views do you have on this? Um, thank you. Um, well, I agree very much with Michael. Um, uh, um, although the, the amendment which you uh, successfully pressed is extremely useful um, as a moderating, uh, uh, having a moder moderating effect on the market principles, it does leave the market principles in the primary position and the uh, products of frameworks where implemented is exceptional. Uh, and of course, the question as to how the framework's power will be exercised does go to the relative importance on the one hand of the market access principles and on the other, the products of the common frameworks process. So 
I would be hoping for a generous um, application of those um, uh, order making powers. Because if you believe, as I do, that the UK government ought together to proceed on the basis of collaborative and cooperative working rather than a, a directive lead from the centre, then you would want regulation by agreement to displace the market access principles wherever possible. Um, uh, whether that will in fact be the case, I rather doubt, but that is what I would be hoping for. Thank you very much. Jess, how do you see this issue? Great. No, I agree with um, everything that's been said. Um, I think, as, as Michael mentioned, there are those consent provisions on the use of those powers, but actually I think the greater risk is that those powers won't be used, despite the devolved administrations making the case. And I think the UK government have been clear that even though they these powers now exist, they're kind of... Um, their intention is that they should be used very rarely, if at all. Now, I don't think that is necessarily the right position. I think um, the UK Internal Market Act um, from white paper to legislation um, was passed very quickly. I think there wasn't enough of an exploration of um, kind of its impact on specific policy sectors. And actually common frameworks are going to be doing all that detailed work. So they're best placed to um, consider where exclusions might be appropriate and might be necessary. So as well as the kind of um, constitutional reasons uh, that Hugh mentioned for um, for, for uh, as reasons why the UK government should be open to new exclusions, I think there are also practical policy um, reasons that means that they should they should be open to new exclusions. I think there is a need to establish very clear protocols around how these new powers would be used, um, and that should be on the basis of agreement between all four nations. I think there needs to be clear criteria um, as to what what particular issues should be considered for an exclusion um, and which might not be. Um, I think there's also a question of how common frameworks discussions will feed into the mechanisms by which uh, new exclusions will be um, decided. Uh, so Bayes has committed to um, holding annual uh, meetings, intergovernmental meetings, to cons uh, consult the devolved administrations on new exclusions. There's a question of how particular uh, policy expertise from common frameworks or evidence or information should feed into those discussions. Um, so I think that's going to be a big program of work and a big challenge um, for all four governments going forward um, is understand, get, gaining a shared understanding and agreement about when these powers should be used. Um, and I think it's also important that the UK government is open to that um, in order to make this framework work effectively in future, because I think if they're not open to that, um, then I think we're just going to see further disputes down the line where the devolved administrations think there is a case um, for this power to be used. Um, and if the UK government continues to take the kind of stance that it shouldn't be. Well, thank you all very much indeed for these very interesting answers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, can we move now to uh, uh, some questions on Northern Ireland? And I'm going to ask Lord Kane and then Lady Ritchie to focus on that. Lord Kane? Jonathan, are you with us? I am. I am sorry, I was on mute. Apologies. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I suppose my questions are principally directed at, uh, at Jess, but if uh, Michael or um, Hugh want to chip in, then obviously uh, uh, feel free. Um, Jess, to some extent, you've already touched on my, my first question, which was uh, really to comment on the uh, relationship between the uh, uh, common frameworks and the, and the protocol. Uh, but I wondered if um, perhaps slightly more specifically, you could um, uh, just um, uh, comment about the uh, what role um, could or should common frameworks play in considering um, any new rules that are introduced uh, through the protocol? And perhaps if I can be slightly more provocative, um, uh, um, uh, how would you react to the assertion uh, made by some of my Ulster Unionist colleagues um, that the effects of the protocol, uh, rather than establishing common UK frameworks, essentially turns Northern Ireland into little more than a colony of the EU? 
Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, just to reiterate my earlier point, there is quite a significant intersection between common framework areas and the protocol. Um, my kind of most recent analysis of the legislative of the 18 legislative frameworks, um, my analysis suggests about 15 of those are covered by the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and obviously those are considered very important areas. Um, I think common frameworks will be a really important forum through which um, changes to EU law that will be applicable in Northern Ireland should be considered. Obviously, they'll need to be considered slightly differently to perhaps a legislative um, a proposal from somewhere in Great Britain, because uh, Northern Ireland won't have discretion about whether or not to adopt that, that EU uh, regulation or directive. In the case of directives, it might have the opportunity to um, determine how it applies um, that particular um, EU Act, and I think uh, I think common frameworks could be a good, good forum to be able to discuss how that could be applied in, in a way that uh, creates least friction in the UK internal market. I think they should also be a forum for um, GB to think about how it might need to respond in its regulations to changes um, uh, at an EU level. Um, the UK government has made it very clear that its intention is to uh, ensure the integrity of the internal market. And I think if it's serious about that, that might require in some circumstances, um, perhaps making changes to its own regulation um, in order to prevent friction that could be created by Northern Ireland applying EU law. Um, so I think that should definitely um, be an option. Um, I wouldn't want to comment specifically on the kind of slightly uh, political kind of questions about the protocol, um, but I think I think going forward, as I say, um, if protecting the internal market is a key aim of, 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 of the UK government, then it, it needs to be open to responding uh, to responding to EU law um, in that in in that way that could that could minimize friction even if sometimes it might prevent them from doing something that that they might want to do um so i think yeah i think uh common frameworks would be particularly important um for discussing that i think the other thing um which might touch on to a question you might be asking uh, shortly um is thinking about how uh information about uh, new EU acts that have relevance for the protocol will feed into common framework discussions. Um, it's the Joint Consultative Working Group, um, which is one of the bodies established by the withdrawal agreement, which is foreseen as the kind of primary forum through which the UK and the EU will um, exchange that information. It's not quite clear who in UK government will have responsibility for that, but there needs to be a mechanism to make sure that any information that is passed to the UK government through that feeds into common frameworks um, and discussion at, at that level and I think that's something the UK government hasn't quite grappled with yet about how it's going to um, consider changes to EU law with specific relevance to the protocol but also more widely kind of Michael raised the point earlier that that might have implications for what the UK wants to do on its own regulation um, so I think there's a lot of unanswered questions here about exactly how that will work um, but I think common frameworks provide a good opportunity to look at it in specific policy areas it isn't isn't one of the other unanswered questions um, how the Northern Ireland Executive will feed directly into the uh, Joint Consultative Committee? Yes, absolutely, and I think that's that's a very important question as well. Obviously, common framework areas, then mostly. Um, uh, concerning devolved areas, it will be the Northern Ireland executive that will have um, responsibility for transposing that particular regulation or such like. So it's very important that they are involved in those discussions. But I think the UK government will also have a role to play, um, not only in uh, areas where it's applying EU law in reserved areas in with, um, with respect to Northern Ireland, but also I think in supporting the Northern Ireland executive uh, to some extent. I think there is concern within the Northern Ireland executive that there's not the capacity to be able to consider um, some of these changes to EU law in quite technical areas that quite often as an EU member the UK government took the lead on. Um, so I think it's very important that the Northern Ireland executive are there um, at, at those discussions but also that they are supported to be able to consider the implications of, of those discussions and changes uh, to EU law for Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. Um, Margaret, um, can we have your question? And uh, I, th I should say to all members of the committee that um, we, uh, given the time, not every witness um, need be invited if there is an appropriate choice. Um, and so if I can move on to um, Margaret, Lady Ritchie. Um, thank you, Chair. And again, I suppose from what has been written in the various submissions, 
this question uh, again about the protocol and its directive really Jess. I would also say that um, the House of Lords is going to establish a um, subcommittee of the EU committee on the Northern Ireland Protocol and there will be intersection between the work of that committee, presumably, and the work that we're currently doing. But the first question is, where relevant, how should common frameworks make use of the bodies for British-Irish cooperation and also North-South cooperation on the island of Ireland established under the Good Friday Agreement? And secondly, Jess, in your submission to us, uh, you're stating about regulatory provisions, the parties to each common framework should explore alternative mechanisms for considering the potential economic impact of divergence <clears throat> between Northern Ireland and GB created by changes to EU law. You've already referred to the issue of capacity. So do you think there is capacity within the Cabinet Office, the Northern Ireland Office, and the devolved administrations, particularly the Northern Ireland executive, to do this body of work and to act upon it, particularly when this uh, body of work will cause fissures and division within the Northern Ireland executive because of the issues of the constitution I'll question and issues to do with ident political identity. Thank you, Chair. Excellent, thanks. Um, I think you raised a lot of interesting uh, questions and, and, and points um, in that question. Um, I think there are opportunities for the bodies established by the Good Friday Agreement to um, aid the work on common frameworks. Um, obviously, where it's a north-south body, um, it will it's it's only appropriate for the for the Northern Ireland executive to be involved in that from from the UK side um, and I think that could be a particularly important forum for potentially attempting to influence EU law that will apply to Northern Ireland obviously Northern Ireland will no longer be part of a member state but uh, the Republic of Ireland will remain a member state and I think um, using that as a forum for discussions of potential changes to EU law that will have implications for both and where they have a a common and shared interests will be really important. Um, in common frameworks more widely, I think the British Irish Council, um, in which the, the devolved administrations and Crown dependencies sit, will be a really useful opportunity to discuss um, regulation where there might be shared interests um, across um, both uh, the UK and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and I think although it might not be appropriate for those to be formally part of a specific kind of common framework process. I think there are informal opportunities to use that as a forum to discuss some of the issues that are being considered um, in common frameworks. Um, on your specific point about capacity for assessing the economic impact um, of, of the uh, uh, of the protocol. Um, that particular point was in reference to um, the role of the Office for the Internal Market, which is, um, which is established by the UK Internal Market Act. So from my understanding of the Act, any regulation or uh, legislative provision that gives effect to the Northern Ireland Protocol is explicitly excluded from the remit of the Office for the Internal Market. Now, the Office for the Internal Market is foreseen to play a very important role in kind of establishing the economic impact of regulatory divergence. To me, I think the biggest potential for an economic impact of reg reg regulatory divergence is through the Northern Ireland Protocol. So I think it's a shame that it has explicitly been excluded from that remit. I think there are obvious reasons for doing that in terms of the UK government not wanting to make this kind of independent office the ultimate arbiter of whether or not the Northern Ireland Protocol is working. But having said that, there is still the need you know, for that evidence to be considered um, in discussions through common frameworks and elsewhere. Um, and so I think there is the need to kind of consider alternative mechanisms for doing that. Um, I think there are certainly concerns about both the capacity um, to conduct that research and uh, the, the political sensitivities, um, I think particularly, as you say, in, in Northern Ireland. I think there's a risk um, that both the UK government and the Northern Ireland executive, because of the political sensitivities, don't undertake the work to assess the consequences of, of the Northern Ireland Protocol because it's too politically, politically difficult. And I think that would be a real problem because 
there, that there could be issues that it creates um, that have implications for the Northern Ireland economy that aren't being addressed um, if that analysis hasn't been done. Um, so I think it's really important that that happens somewhere. Um, I think as well as, as Common Frameworks providing an opportunity for it, there are obviously discussions um, between the UK and the EU, primarily through uh, the Joint Committee and, as I mentioned earlier, the Joint Consultative Working Group to consider those aspects. But there is a risk, um, I think, in respect to the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, that people slightly bury their head in the sand um, and that isn't going to make it work effectively. Um, and I think it's really important that the Northern Ireland Protocol does work as effectively as it can. Um, and so I think, yeah, considering ways that common frameworks could play a role um, in, in that analysis, I think is, is really important. Thank you, Jess. Um, if, if we can move on fairly swiftly now, because we are getting near the, uh, the to our half an hour limit, as were. Can I move us on to the intergovernmental relations questions? And uh, Lord Murphy, please. Thank you, uh, Kay. And my question really to all three of you, I think, is how would you describe the current state of intergovernmental relations in the United Kingdom? And just two points to make with regard to that question. The first one is that obviously the current COVID situation has meant that the public in uh, the United Kingdom, in all parts of it, are much, much more aware um, of uh, devolution uh, than they were before, because it's really thrown up the fact that we do live in a country which has devolved administrations. And the second one, and it refers to what Hugh said earlier, is that the concept of shared governance, with which I have a lot of sympathy, by the way, is something that's going to be much more significantly talked about um, in the future. My fear, though, is that would a United Kingdom government of whatever political colour ever really agree um, to equality uh, with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland? Perhaps the best we can hope for is first amongst equals, but who knows? But I do think that the current pandemic and the current crisis has really thrown up this question in a totally different light. And I'd be very grateful for uh, your brief comments um, on where you think we are with regard to intergovernment relations. Oh, and perhaps you could start off if that's possible. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I don't think it would surprise the committee if I said that my impression of the current state of intergovernmental relations is that they are poor, uh, they, they are operating in a low trust environment, um, and we can talk further about that if you like, but I just want to add a, a nuance to that. Um, it's always important to remember the uh, official to official discussions that carry on on a continuing basis between administrations, um, regardless of what is happening, as it were, in the political debate, or not, or not regardless, but almost separately from what is happening in the in the uh, political domain officials do talk to each other on a very regular basis they quite often know each other and they can have uh, discussions and perhaps fly kites um, and um, ease some of the difficulties between administrations uh, in that way and as a special example and taking uh, the point you make lord murphy about um, COVID. Of course, the uh, working relations between the chief medical officers uh, of the four administrations has been exceptionally close throughout the, um, the COVID experience. And so uh, while there have been no doubt been bumpy experiences at the political level, um, the, the, there is always this um, undertow, if you like, of official and professional relationships which do help the intergovernmental relationship to work but if of course at the political level um, uh, things are operating at a very low trust um, um, basis now um, one reflection i would have is that um, this isn't inevitable um, it was extremely noticeable um, during the time of Mrs. May's government, 
when Sir David Liddington was given responsibility for the management of intergovernmental relations, how um, over a, a relatively short period of time, at a personal level, those improved enormously because of the obvious effort and commitment that he was putting in to um, making those relationships work um, as seeing it very much as part of the way that the UK as a whole should be governed. So this isn't an in inevitable, I think. There will always be political disagreements. Everyone has to understand that and accept that. But it, the personal element can be um, uh, forgotten about, and I do think it's quite important. Thank you very much indeed. And I entirely endorse what you say about uh, David Livington. I think that individual um, commitment to devolution by um, ministers is significant, but also their personalities. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, Michael, can you um, add your views to where you, you yes, think yes. we are? On what he was saying, I think, uh, for obvious political reasons, relationships at the political level are, are not good at the moment, and the Brexit process really has shown how, how problematic they've become. At the official level, Yes, there's a lot of constant uh, working at the official level, but attention in Whitehall through some of the departments is, is sporadic. Uh, they, they just forget about Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not that they're trying to do the devolves down, they just forget them. They're there. And I remember back between 1977 and 1979, I used to teach devolution at the Civil Service College in London. I used to fly down there because it was important for the civil servants to know what devolution was about. And that didn't happen next time around although I do go down there from time to time and talk to Whitehall officials. So they're conscious, or the leadership in Whitehall is conscious of the need to do that, but, but other things just seem to get in, in the way. On shared governance, uh, yes, uh, absolutely. We've only got a few minutes, so I'm not going to go into detail about all the ideas that we've been putting forward, but uh, I am very interested in the philosophy of the Welsh government in recent years. And, developing this idea of shared government and, and cooperation. Although I have to say that the Welsh tend to put more emphasis on shared government and the Scottish government tends to put more emphasis on doing things uh, itself autonomously. Uh, they're not incompatible, but there is a difference in emphasis there that must be uh, respected. Uh, and then finally, we've got all these ad hoc measures in intergovernmental relations. And I just mentioned before, we've got about six consent mechanisms, the Sewell Convention, the transfer of powers to the devolves is a section 30 order in the Scotland Act. The EU Withdrawal Act has got another one. The Internal Market Act has got another one. And now we've got the Competition and Markets Authority appointments and they all have different consent mechanisms. And I think that reflects the absence of philosophy about intergovernmental relations and about the role of the devolves and how far the devolves should be required to go along with common policy because the underlying principle of the whole system is at the end of the day, the UK government always has the last word. It doesn't always exercise that last word. It doesn't always overrule, of course, not at all. But the very fact that it has the last word has an effect on the entire process because negotiations are conducted in the shadow of this hierarchical relationship in which we know that one side can get it some way if it comes to a conflict. Thank you very much indeed. And Jess, how do you see this perhaps from a Northern Ireland perspective? No, I would agree um, with, with everything that was said um, and uh, with you as well, Lord Murphy, I think as well as uh, coronavirus raising the profile of devolution amongst the public, I think it's also raised awareness amongst UK ministers, who I think in, in some cases were perhaps a bit surprised um, when the different devolved administrations started taking their own approach um, to, for example, lockdown restrictions. Um, so I think, um, I think in terms of your question about shared governance and whether that's kind of feasible from a UK government perspective, I think to some extent they've had a bit of a, a wake up call in that they've realised that, well they should realise now, um, that when we're talking about devolved areas, if the UK wants, if the UK government wants a UK wide consistency, it has to be on the basis of agreement and consensus between the four governments. It can't just simply uh, do what it was intending to do and hope that the devolved administrations will follow along. I think that perhaps is a distinction to be made here about areas that are reserved, where the UK government ho does hold the decision making powers, and areas where it is acting only for England. Um, and I think 
think we need to bring out that distinction a bit more and the UK government needs to recognise that in some areas it is only acting for England um, and as I said before yeah any any kind of UK wide decisions must take place on the basis of consensus. Thank you very much indeed I think Lord Fuchs is likely to say something about the English side of things. Thank you all three of you very much indeed. Thank you Paul. Lord Garnier and your question? Thank you, uh, and uh, I apologise if, if, if what I'm about to say uh, repeats what's already been said. I had to, as I say, step out of the room for about 20 minutes. Um, I was interested in in all three of uh, you uh, in your responses to the questions from Lord Murphy, uh, I, and I was particularly fascinated by the, the point that you made that at official level, discussions are going on at an altogether more constructive uh, fashion than they are at political level. At political level, it strikes me, and this was reflected in the evidence we had from two uh, ministers, one from Wales and one from Scotland, before the enactment of the UK Internal Market Act. Uh, but the position I, the, the, that I understood from, from them was that relations politically were very, very bad indeed, and I think you've under, underlined that. We look as though we're, we're we're listening to a dialogue of the deaf politically, or, or four people are talking to at each other in different languages. Uh, and I don't know whether the Internal Market Act is simply emblematic of that, or whether it provided a, a catalyst for aggravation and argument uh, independently of the existing uh, background. Do you think... Um, this is curable, or do you think that uh, the problems we had over the Internal Market Act uh, will cement the dissent between the, the four parts of the United Kingdom, uh, and by that I mean UK and England almost as one thing, and the, and the three devolved administrations as another? Uh, or do you think, um, as we get into the election period of, of May, for example, uh, that it's just going to get worse and worse and worse, and that despite the hard work of officials, uh, the the union of the United Kingdom of uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland is about to uh, fall apart. Uh, Jess, perhaps you could go first. Thank you. Um, no, that's a, a really interesting question, and I think I think there are. Um, questions about whether official level working on the UK Internal Market Act specifically um, is, is, is going well. Um, and I think, unfortunately, um, it, it's probably not. Um, I think, obviously, the UK government is very concerned about the future of the union and its approach to that um, has been to, to some extent, to compete um, with the devolved administrations rather than to cooperate with them. And I think this is in part where we see some of the problems arise. Um, in the case of the UK Internal Market Act, obviously it was passed without consent um, of the Scottish government or the, or the Welsh government, or sorry, I should say the, the legislatures as it's an interparliamentary process. Um, but certainly there were big objections from the Scottish and Welsh government I think the UK government could argue that the Scottish government doesn't have much incentive to agree um, because it won't necessarily, you know, if it creates a problem, then that could further its ultimate aim of achieving independence. I don't think you could say the same about the Welsh government. And I think I think the Welsh government never opposed the principles. Um, I'm sure you could uh, tell, tell us more about this, but I think there probably was a compromise that could have been reached there if the UK government was willing to make concessions, um, but it wasn't. And I think the speed at which um, it introduced the, the white paper and then the legislation really suggested that it wasn't particularly open to having a discussion about this, to trying to find a solution that suited all parties. Um, it would use the kind of uh, blunt mechanism of UK parliamentary sovereignty to pass what it thought was the best solution. Um, and I think unless there is a change of approach for the UK government, I think we are likely to see this kind of um, dynamic uh, occur again. Um, so I think there is a problem. Um, and I think I would also question whether the UK's competitive strategy of saving the union is necessarily um, a good one, because fundamentally devolution is popular in, in Scotland and Wales and in Northern Ireland. You know, ma no matter what your constitutional preference, um, there is a lot of support for having a devolved government within the United Kingdom at least. Um, and I think certainly the Prime Minister's comments um, about 
devolution uh, compounded with some of the actions taken, for example, in the UK Internal Market Bill, have perhaps quite rightly uh, created concern about whether the UK government is, is trying to roll back devolution. So I think unless we see a change of approach, um, I think it's difficult to see how intergovernmental relations could get better at this point. What if I could then go on to uh, Hugh Rawlings in, in Wales and then, and then come on to Michael Keating from Scotland? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I very much agree um, with what Jess has said. Um, I think so far as the, um, the Internal Market Act is concerned, it has exacerbated problems. It has added to difficulties that were already there with Brexit. And it did so, obviously, by being brought forward with the minimum of consultation um, with the uh, devolved administrations. And I think, um, I mean, in the classic uh, distinction, which one always talks about government, was it cock up or conspiracy? My initial thought was that the um, internal market bill was the result of a lack of coherence within the UK government as to what their devolution policy was. But I think now that if one um, looks at the act as, uh, as it has resulted from the parliamentary process and set that alongside the um, decision to centralise the uh, Strategic Prosperity Fund and take those powers away from the devolved administrations, one begins to see the makings of what looks like an attack on devolution. And that, of course, um, is uh, not going to uh, make the conduct of intergovernmental relations any easier. Um, the Welsh government is in a particularly difficult position in this respect because, of course, it is simultaneously um, strongly devolutionist and strongly unionist. It wants a union, it wants the union to be maintained, but it wants a strong devolution settlement. And therefore it finds that the position extremely difficult when there appear to be um, uh, attacks on the idea of devolution uh, as contained in giving priority to the internal market uh, act market principles and also the centralization of funding. Um, so we have now reached the point, and I'm sure um, uh, Lord Thomas is aware of this, possibly Lord Hope as well, um, that the Council General um, ha is making an application for judicial review um, uh, as to, uh, to seek de uh, declaratory relief as to exactly what the Internal Market Act does uh, to devolve legislative competence and what limitations, if any, there are of a constitutional character on the use of the secondary legislative powers um, in that act. The fact that there has to be recourse to the courts um, on something um, uh, like this brought by a unionist government shows the depth to which we have fallen really um, uh, in, in this sort of dialogue of the deaf. Well, we've got form for this because, uh, as I know from my own experience with the prorogation case, uh, and it will set up another battle between uh, the executive and, and the judiciary, which is going to play out and not to anybody's advantage, I fear. But, uh, Michael, please. Uh, yes, well, of course, devolution was always a compromise between different views of, of the constitution and what the nature of the union is. That's, that's just a, a, a fact. The Scottish government has one position, the UK government has a different position, the Welsh government has a different position and so on. It doesn't mean that the constitution can't work. It's, it's a situation that has to be resolved and we have to live with, but it's become much more confrontational, partly because of the dynamics of devolution, uh, but partly because of the UK government's failure to understand uh, what devolution is, is, is really about. And, and I'm not just referring to this particular government. And Hugh's given some examples of that. Uh, Jess mentioned this, this, this competing notion, competitive notion of, of devolution, each side trying to gain political credit, trying to gain political territory. Uh, and we've seen this in the COVID crisis as, as well. 
And these new powers that the UK government's taking to spend in the devolved areas is clearly part of that, to show that they can do things, uh, provide things to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland that they say wouldn't otherwise be uh, there. Uh, that I find is just really quite unhelpful. Uh, and not only is it unhelpful politically, but it's also quite dangerous in creating waste and duplication in, in spending of one sort or another. Uh, there was one thing in the internal market white paper I noticed. The UK said, well, government said, well, the UK has a unitary state, therefore, and I thought, well, hold on, that, that is not agreed. We're, we're a devolved state, we're a union. The, 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 the language is, is quite indicative there. So I think we've got to find ways in which we can live with these different perspectives, which are all legitimate. After all, in Northern Ireland, we have extremely different positions of parties that have to come into government together and, and respect these different understandings. So it's a matter of respecting the perspective of the other side, which a lot else follows. The institutions, we haven't time to get on the institutions this morning, but I, there are some institutional mechanisms that I think would help that by eliminating elements of hierarchy and providing neutral spaces and institutions which don't depend on either government that can broker and mediate these different visions of the constitution. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much indeed. Fascinating answers and really, really uh, helpful to us. Um, can I urge committee and witnesses to uh, be slightly shorter as we go through the next series? Because I'm going to have to ask for about 10 minutes extra of your time, if you don't mind. So if I can go on to Lord Thomas and then Lord Fuchs, please. Can I come back to the subject of intergovernmental relations and in particular ask you, to answer very briefly, what would you see as the practical changes necessary to try and make things work better? And should you replace the JMC with a formal council of ministers? And Jess, can I, this is a vast subject, can I take you first, but briefly, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I, I have certainly not done as much research into this um, as other witnesses, so I will, I will be particularly brief. But I think what I would just um, emphasise is perhaps um, the need for uh, mechanisms or forums that facilitate um, kind of modern working um, and the issues of the day um, for the four governments. Um, I think in particular, as I mentioned uh, at, right at the beginning, uh, there are these different programmes of work on the internal market and no coherent structure through which they can be managed. Um, so from my perspective I'd be particularly interested um, to see coming out of the intergovernmental review um, some awareness of those cross-cutting challenges and appropriate forums to uh, facilitate discussion on those. Thank you very much. Uh, Hugh. Um, I think I would hope to see two things coming out of the I, uh, IGR review. Um, first a change of culture uh, based on a recognition that the effective conduct of intergovernmental relations is part of business as usual governance. This is not something exceptional. We have four governments with a relatively high degree of interdependence. We need to put in place machinery to enable those, that um, uh, discussion to take place and for it to be done, recognised as a perfectly normal piece of governmental action. And I would associate with that uh, the need for a dispute resolution mechanism, which all governments have signed up to are, and are happy to operate. And as, as Michael uh, suggested earlier, um, uh, that probably will involve some third party assistance on occasion to uh, enable the parties to reach a con conclusion. Um, on the Council of Ministers point, I think, of course, this is not just a change of name, it's a change of function. Um, it would be um, transforming the uh, present JMC from a largely consultative body to a decision-making body, um, perhaps with majority voting. And frankly, picking up the, um, the theme that we were discussing previously, at this stage, given the low levels of trust between the governments, I think it's probably a step too far at the moment. It might be something to happen down the track if the, only the culture and the levels of trust could be improved. Thank you very much. And then Michael? Uh, yes, I, I, I like the idea of a council of ministers that more than the joint ministerial council we've got uh, at the moment, with a parity of esteem, as they say, in Northern Ireland, not a vertical, but a horizontal meeting of 
different governments bringing their own responsibilities together. Uh, yes, maybe there could be some voting mechanism. There are precedents. In Spain, they have a, a mechanism, a weighted voting mechanism there. Uh, in Belgium, they have voting mechanisms. They probably wouldn't be used very often, but as a backstop, it would be useful to say the UK government can't necessarily get its way uh, in all circumstances. We'd have to think how England and English regions would fit into that because it's not satisfactory that the UK government should represent England and the UK, hold the ring as the UK, as it were, but at the same time represent England. I'd like to see some capacity in there in these mechanisms for research uh, doing the uh, assessment of the impact of various mechanisms, uh, rather than having the governments just bringing their own uh, evidence together. And again, there are precedents for that in international organizations. Uh, and then a better mediation and dispute resolution mechanism. And I think if you have that in place and you have those, the certainty of those instruments, then that feeds back into, into the entire process because then it would ensure that all the way from the official level to the ministerial level to dealing with policy, detailed policy matters, uh, you know that all governments have got to be treated with respect and their powers and competences taken seriously. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And uh, Lord Fuchs, uh, rather large questions, but I hope we can deal with it fairly swiftly. Thanks. And Michael's already touched on it. And uh, I, I make uh, no uh, excuses for the fact that there are people in Whitehall who don't understand devolution. And that has been a problem with all governments. Uh, uh, but equally, the SNP don't believe in devolution. They want something completely different. And if devolution doesn't work, it, it benefits them. But uh, Hugh has referred, and others have referred, to four governments. But as Michael just said, the problem, one of the biggest problems, is that the UK government has to represent England and then has to hold the ring as representing the United Kingdom. And that is a very difficult thing to do. Is that not one of the major problems? And how, how would we resolve it? Uh, would you agree with Gordon Brown, who in his article in The Telegraph yesterday uh, put forward a solution? Uh, which is to look at the constitution of the United Kingdom and actually complete devolution uh, in relation particularly now to England. Hugh, I think maybe, maybe you should start. Um, yes, thank you. I, I, I think uh, in some ways the, um, the, the conflation of the UK government as being representing both England and, and, and the whole of the UK is less of a problem for the devolved administrations. We just would sort of look to negotiate with who we were faced with across the table. It's, it's more of a problem, I think, for the UK government itself, yeah. because I think there is considerable confusion. And frankly, I think there's a certain unwillingness on the part of at least some ministers to acknowledge the limitations of the or the territorial limitations of their powers. And I think you see that very clearly um, in the um, uh, COVID press conferences, where it is very often unclear as to whether ministers are um, uh, speaking um, on new measures for England or, or for the UK. I do understand how difficult it is. I mean, I was thinking about the position of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who on the one hand in the same speech had to announce furlough arrangements for the whole of the UK, and yet perfectly sensibly, because it was all part of the same package, then went on to talk about um, uh, um, a, a rates holiday, whereas, of course, rates are part of the local government settlement and, and are devolved. And understandably, he didn't talk about a rates holiday in England. So there is a problem, but I think there's a certain unwillingness in Whitehall to recognise it. And of course, the, with the national press, the symbiotic relationship between the national press and the Whitehall government, the national press is distinctly unwilling to recognise the realities of the distribution of power within the UK and always talks about government as if it, um, uh, what is said by Whitehall um, covers everywhere. Um, as to what you could do about it, well, of course, you could do 
um, a, a sort of a badging exercise and, and, and uh, identify certain departments as specifically related to um, to England. But that is, you know, just the sort of that it's uh, it might be useful, but it's very limited. The reality of the matter, I suspect, and it goes back to your quest, uh, your point about Gordon Brown. If we uh, the you can only differentiate between uh, the responsibilities in respect of England and in respect of the UK if you have two different governments. In other words, if you have a fully federal system with a federal government for the UK and a government of England. But of course, that represents a most radical um, set of constitutional proposals, which might be what is necessary, but is very, very difficult. Well, even more radical is the breakup of the United Kingdom, which is uh, on its way unless the United Kingdom government does something about it. Maybe Michael Keating would uh, agree and, and come up with a solution for saving the United Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we go back a long way on this, George. Um, we're not going to get a solution to the English question until the English decide what the question is, let alone the answer. There are multiple ways. There's an English question, a regional question, uh, 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 and so on. There's no consensus. There's no appetite in England for federalism. Uh, we insisted in devolution for Scotland because we wanted it. We can't thrust a solution on the English just to suit the convenience of the devolve. That debate has to take place in England. Maybe it will in due course of time. Maybe we'll be able to talk about it. I'm skeptical about a big band constitutional convention and, and a written constitution simply because we don't have consensus. We just, we explain for, for, forever. The devolution will proceed incrementally. There have already been big changes in Scotland and even more dramatically really in Wales, considering where they started from. Uh, the interest in England is about regional mayors and the, the regional agenda and so on, city regions uh, and other things as well, rather than where England fits into the union. That's a political fact and we can't, uh, we can't get past that simply in order to have some kind of neat symmetry within the systems. So we've got to work around that. Uh, and things like a UK Council of Ministers, well, when I suggested something's got to be done for England, it won't be an English government. It may be a UK minister speaking for England. It may, there may be something else. There may be an English regional presence. Uh, but th there's something missing there that's important. But it's simply, th there's not a neat solution. Uh, and until somebody tells me what federalism will mean for England, then I can't see where federalism is going to come into this solution. Thank you very much. We're still waiting for the Dunlop report and the intergovernmental uh, report uh, anxiously. Maybe that will help us. I think we might move on to our last yeah. set of questions now, if you don't mind, Jess, we're missing you out of that one. Can I ask Lady Crawley and Lady Redfern and Lady Randerson to be quite brief? And I do apologise for putting pressure on you at the end of the meeting. And likewise, our witnesses. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Kay. Um, I want to ask about scrutiny. How important is parliamentary scrutiny of, of common frameworks? Uh, and is there a trade-off between effective intergovernmental processes and effective scrutiny? Um, our committee uh, have been able to measure the success or otherwise of our scrutiny uh, when it comes to our dealings with ministers and government departments. However, uh, that measurement is a lot more tenuous when it comes to our dealings with the devolved administrations. And I know that they're appreciative of the work we're doing on uh, common frameworks. Um, and some of that work is useful to them in their lobbying of their own executives. But um, does it matter that we can't measure this um, in detail uh, because of the nature of uh, intergovernmental working on common frameworks? Uh, could I ask uh, Hugh, please? Um, I think it's important as a matter of principle that there should be uh, parliamentary scrutiny of uh, common frameworks um, uh, in all four legislatures. Um, I think it, it needs to be limited 
scope for influencing the detailed content of frameworks, because those are a matter of some quite detailed and sometimes difficult intergovernmental negotiation. And even if a particular uh, parliament comes up with a bright idea for improving the frameworks in some respect, it'd be very difficult to get all four governments to agree. So I would have said that scrutiny, which is important, but it should be focused on how the frameworks are working. And um, in that respect, um, if you had a requirement um, for the publication of annual reviews or something like that to facilitate uh, uh, scrutiny of how the frameworks are working, then I think that would be a very useful uh, addition. Thank you. Um, and I'm happy to pass on to, um, I think it's Liz next. Yeah. Lady Red. Yes, th yes, thank you. Thank you, Kay. Um, my question is, uh, and can I address it to Hugh first, because you uh, did touch on uh, collaboration and cooperation. My question is, how should individual frameworks facilitate ongoing uh, scrutiny by relevant select committees for the programme as a whole? And should they be scrutinised uh, holistically from a UK wide perspective? Uh, which would show greater cooperation between the UK and the devolved uh, legislatures. And finally, should common frameworks be encouraged to public annual reviews? And I know, Hugh, you've just mentioned that. So can I go to Hugh first, then Jess, and then Michael? Thank you. Well, I think it's important that individual the operation of individual frameworks should be the subject of scrutiny, but it does need uh, to be the subject of holistic oversight as well. Um, uh, I think uh, um, earlier we, we talked about the uh, lack of consistency um, uh, in the frameworks and the need for a template and a more um, consistent approach across uh, the common frameworks. I think that if you only had um, the operation of individual frameworks subject to scrutiny, you would lose the possibility of having uh, an overall look at the, the common frameworks programme with a view to maintaining uh, consistency across the board so far as that is appropriate. Um, it won't be absolutely appropriate, but um, uh, you can't have a, um, a one size fits all for these frameworks, but there does need to be, I think, an overview of how the frameworks programme as a whole um, is working out. Thank you. Yes, I, I would completely um, agree. I think as well as um, scrutiny, I think there needs to be as much transparency as possible yeah. around common yes. frameworks. Yeah. And also to make sure that the, those kind of documents that are published in the name of transparency are accessible, um, particularly to people who people from outside Parliament who might have a particular interest in this. Um, I noticed over Christmas, the UK government published just one single page where it published all those common frameworks, a very simple thing, but I think actually a very useful development. So I think as well as thinking about scrutiny and transparency, I think there are perhaps more that can be done to help um, interested stakeholders or individuals follow the development of certain common frameworks to ensure that they don't miss opportunities to feed in where, where they are presented with them. Thank you, Jess. And uh, uh, Michael, please, because you have mentioned standardise as well in some of your comments, Michael. So if you could just come in. Yeah, yes. Well, we, we know that when things are taken into intergovernmental route, arenas, it becomes much more difficult for parliaments to scrutinize them because these negotiations are very often confidential. The burden of scrutiny is increasing all the time with the Brexit legislation, with the complications of devolution. This is a problem for the House of Commons, your, your own house, and for the devolved legislatures as well. And it's going to be very important to try and prioritize things because you can't try and look at everything in detail, given the detail of some of these frameworks. It would be important to encourage frameworks to be simpler rather than complex, rather than trying to cover everything. Not only does that make for better policy, but it also makes for easier scrutiny and to focus on what are the really important things. And then finally, I think it's important to encourage interparliamentary discussions here, discussions between the, the Westminster and the devolved legislatures. There's a lot of potential there and a lot of goodwill to try and do that, to spread the burden and to share things where you've got a cross UK or cross GB framework that the various parliaments could come together 
to discuss that and, and see what the real issues are there. Thank you all. Thank you. And finally, um, but not least, absolutely not least, I come to Lady Randerson and your question, Jenny. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, at this very late stage in the meeting, can I declare an interest in, uh, because I'm Chancellor of Cardiff University and uh, Dr. Hugh Rawlings is an honorary professor there. Um, can I take up um, Michael's final point and, and start by asking Hugh and Jess, and then let Michael come in if he uh, wants to add, uh, about interparliamentary cooperation. Do you think that there should be formal interparliamentary cooperation? Um, there was an interparliamentary forum on Brexit, which seems to have fallen into uh, disuse. Do you think it should be a formal structure or an informal structure um, in terms of how the parliamentary institutions treat and deal with common frameworks. And do and finally, do you think that the House of Lords has a has a particular role and you don't have to say yes to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, I think uh, to pick up the, the, the second point, uh, yes, I do think um, the House of Lords could um, have a, uh, a convening role for um, uh, scrutiny. Um, I think whether uh, there needs to be formal or um, informal interparliamentary arrangements depends to a very large extent on how the Common Frameworks Programme develops. I mean, there are some of us who are still very worried about that the, the, the um, UK Internal Market Act may result ultimately in the Common Frameworks um, Programme uh, losing uh, focus and momentum. Um, so there's not, not much point in setting up formal arrangements um, uh, to uh, scrutinize something like that. But it, assuming that the um, uh, frameworks program does uh, progress and succeed, then I think formal arrangements would be a good thing. Um, I have noted that the Interparliamentary Forum on Brexit um, fell into disuse. I think it would probably be interesting for the committee to find out why that was and what lessons can be learned from that, because until about September 2019, it seemed to be going really very well. And all of a sudden it came to a halt. Not sure what happened then. No. <laughs> Yes. yes, I think you were, you were the next to go on this briefly, please. Yeah, great. Thanks. No, I think interparliamentary cooperation um, is very important because ultimately I think the best chance of influencing intergovernmental processes um, comes if there is interparliamentary agreement on specific recommendations. Um, my only reservation about formal uh, mechanisms um, for interparliamentary working would be some of the political and procedural challenges of potentially working with the Northern Ireland Assembly specifically. Um, I think that is something that would uh, need to be considered and I think it would be a problem if we ended up with interparliamentary uh, um, fora that didn't include uh, Northern Ireland representatives considering how important it is um, for their views to feed into this process so that would be my one kind of reservation I think there is a lot that can be done with um, informal um, opportunities even something as simple as one of the letters that came out of the uh, interparliamentary forum on Brexit which just highlighted where uh, different committees had made common recommendations something as simple as that I think um, can be really impactful um, and so I think this would all need to be to be considered but I think some form of interparliamentary working will be really important in this space. Michael? Yes, I do think interparliamentary working is important, but I think it should really be at committee level where we've got a specific remit and focused on particular issues. Otherwise, these things become talking shops and if they're formalised, they've just become purely formal and they feel they have to meet every six months or so. But working with committees of, of, of the House of Lords, the House of Commons, the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Senate, uh, I think there's a lot of, there's a big appetite for that. Members really want to, to do this. Uh, and it sounds like extra work, but in fact, you could economize on a lot of work because instead of doing these things separately, they could pool their understandings and, and agree on a common position. So I think that would be an extremely useful initiative to take. 
Thank you all Thank you. very, very much indeed. It's been an outstanding session and you've shared with us tremendous depth of expertise, but also a very broad, insightful understanding of some of these very, very uh, challenging issues that we're facing across the UK and in relation to devolution and constitutional change. It's been an, a very, very impressive session indeed. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of the committee for your time. And with that, I can now declare this formal committee now closed. Thank you very much indeed.